Welcome to panel number four, uh, Issues for Low-Income Americans. We have three papers this afternoon on this topic, but a mighty number of presenters. Um, I'm going to, I'm Leila Narji. I'm a journalist uh, covering these issues that we will be talking about so today. Food access for low income Americans. Uh, so much of what I hear from folks uh, who are my sources from these stories that, um, that these issues are kind of simple. We need to improve access to uh, not just food, but to healthy food for low income folks living in the US, not just Americans. Uh, and that the best way to do that is by increasing access to SNAP. But of course, when you scratch the surface, you discover that this is a whole ball of wax. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, today we have on our first for our first paper, Isabel Foster, who's the co-founder of youth-led organization Unbox, which was formed in 2020, uh, focused on addressing food insecurity through the lens of policy action, data analysis, and youth activism. With her is Charlie Hoffs, a Stanford undergraduate uh, senior studying chemical engineering, a field she chose in order to understand the science behind and potential technical solutions to human and planetary health challenges. Um, virtually for these guys, they've got Angelina Polselli, who's a recent graduate from the University of San Francisco with a major in politics and a minor in public service and, in co and community engagement. Uh, she's also on the Unbox team as of 2020, uh, 2020 as the policy team lead to help address growing food insecurity in communities and brainstorm ways to make long lasting change to the food system. And finally, on this panel, we have Kyle Winterbor, who has a Master of Public Policy, oh, actually candidate, uh, at UCLA focused on sustainable food system policy, also with Unbox. Uh, Kyle, since 2020, striving to bridge the urban rural divide that persists in policy making, despite both communities facing similar problems like rampant food waste and food insecurity. That's our first paper. Then we have Chiancia Jiang, who is going to be joining us virtually. She's a PhD candidate in the Department of Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Connecticut. Her research interests include exploring the factors that contributed to contribute to obesity related disparity and inequities, examining the influences of built environments on health risks in marginalized groups and applying this knowledge to inform research on community based interventions to promote healthy living. Uh, Sandro, Sandro Steinbeck is with us also um, co author on this paper. Um, assistant Professor in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Con Connecticut, Dr. Steinbach completed his doctoral studies in economics with the Center for Economic Research at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. We think Kristen Cooksey Stowers is with us perhaps online. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Allied Health Sciences at the University of Connecticut. She has a strong interdisciplinary background in health equity, agricultural economics, public policy, and medical sociology. And her research focuses on reducing inequities in diet-related health outcomes by improving macro and micro level food environments through sustainable policy solutions. And then finally, we will have Connor Nolan, a third year law student at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. A native of Iowa, Connor sees firsthand the impact of broken retail food markets, when, retail markets when he returns home. Whether it be the continual growth of dollar stores in his hometown or driving across Iowa towns where dollar stores are the only stores remaining, these effects are ultimately what motivates his research. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome the first team to chat with us um, ex about exploring consumer data privacy and retail competition within SNAP's online purchasing pilot. Take it away. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here today. Our team would like to extend a, a great um, thank you to the Thurman Arnold Project Yale Law School and everyone for attending. It's truly a privilege to be alongside this distinguished panel today. So our group is really excited to talk to you about SNAP and SNAP Online. Our
Okay, thank you. Our team has been deeply studying SNAP and SNAP Online for the past two years and have been closely tracking the expansion of the SNAP Online Purchasing Pilot, SNAP OPP, which was actually first introduced into the 2014 Farm Bill, was piloted in 2019, and then was rapidly expanded across the United States in 2020 during the advent of the COVID-19 crisis. So just for context, SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, was formerly called Food Stamps, and it is used by about 41 million uh, participants in the United States. That's about one in nine Americans. And the SNAP online purchasing pilot, as I mentioned, quickly expanded in 2020, but is now active in 47 states in, as well as DC. However, there are some interesting data privacy as well as competition um, questions that we've been closely tracking over the past two years. So just for context, despite there being um, about 90 retailers active now, 18 states have five or fewer retailers, and there were significantly less active retailers uh, for the, about the first year or so. So our team has been closely studying this, and we did a policy comparison of SNAP OPP using two US federal policy uh, frameworks, the US FTC framework and legislation, the California Consumer Protection Privacy Act, CCPA, and have also been using the EU's uh, GDPR, General Data Privacy Regulation framework as a gold standard to help guide our analysis of assessing SNAP OPP and understanding opportunities for its improvement. Um, as the program continues to grow. As Issa eloquently prefaced, the first angle through which we tried to explore through what regulatory mechanisms is the SNAP online purchasing pilot, privacy policies and marketing tactics by retailers regulated, investigated, litigated, and overseen. We looked at the federal legislative landscape and the only real piece of federal legislation applicable to overseeing not only the SNAP online retail digital marketplace in terms of consumer privacy, but also the broader entire US digital online retail food retail marketplace is the Federal Trade Commission Act, the FTC Act. And the only real regulatory teeth that it has on this issue are pretty dull and they can only really investigate and litigate retailers that violate their own privacy policies. So say Walmart, violating Walmart's own defined privacy policy would be an investigable and potentially litigatable violation of the FTC Act, but none other. And that is problematic for several reasons. First of all, it doesn't allow the FTC Act with enough power to say, investigate violations of the USDA SNAP online purchasing pilot guidelines, for example, which are explicated in a long document, which with which we are very familiar called the SNAP online request for volunteers that was put out for retailers um, and is a selection basis for those retailers. And so the FTC Act cannot litigate retailers for violating the SNAP online purchasing pilot guidelines, for example. Secondly, it allows retailers a lot of latitude to defend their very ambiguous privacy policy language to argue that a attempt a, a, a purported violation is not in fact a violation and finally just at a basic standard it establishes as the gold standard of consumer data privacy in the digital retail marketplace to be retailers on privacy policies so to illustrate just one example of this problematic weak regulatory landscape here is a moment from the USDA request for volunteers SNAP online purchasing pilot guidelines, which explicitly requires SNAP online retailers to require SNAP participants, here referred to as EBT customers, electronic benefits transfer card, which is the card on which SNAP benefits are loaded, customers must opt in, must provide explicit express consent to provide their individual data to these companies to share with third parties. That must be something that one explicitly provides consent for. And here's Fresh Direct's privacy policy 
that explicitly does not do that. That that can give away, according to its own privacy policy, that data to individual data to select partners, affiliates that we believe may have offers of interest to you. So we moved on from this weak federal regulatory landscape to try to find other perhaps state level policies that would be more stringent. I hope everyone can hear me well and clearly, but so since we realized that the federal level really was not providing the correct level of protection, we decided to focus on the California Consumer Privacy Act. So what is the California Consumer Privacy Act? If you're a California resident, you've probably seen it in the shopping malls or when you're doing online shopping, but it was created in 2018 and actually implemented three months before the SNAP online purchasing pilot went full steam ahead in 2020. This is the first state level digital protection legislation across the country. The only other state that's tried to do something close to this piece of legislation was New York, but that unfortunately failed when it was being passed. So this is the strongest piece of legislation that exists in the US right now, which is pretty powerful and pretty amazing to think about. What is the California Consumer Privacy Act? Well, it allows you to do a couple things which are really cool. It allows the consumer to delete their data from any website that is collecting your information. It allows you to file a lawsuit against a certain company if they aren't following the correct rules or you think your data has been violated or not communicated correctly. It allows you to know where your data is going. So you can actually file a request with Amazon, Walmart, Urban Outfitters if you like to shop there and ask where your data is going, which is really powerful. And it allows you to opt out of data. So you are not required to give your data to a company in order to shop there either online or in person. And how does this compare to Snap Online Purchasing Pilot and the RFB that Charlie mentioned earlier? Well, for Snap Online, it actually does not allow customers to access their data easily. So it's pretty complicated if you're a Snap customer or anyone buying groceries online to figure out where your data is going. It also does not allow you to delete your data. So your data will forever be with those companies, which could lead to problematic marketing choices or your data falling into the wrong hands. There is one benefit to the RFB is it allows you to opt in instead of opt out. So your data is not automatically collected. However, if you try and get discounts or you want to sign up to the grocery rewards program, it does require you to give your data over and you can no longer re uh, request for that data to be deleted. And even in sometimes have price changes and price increases if you remove your data from the service, which is pretty alarming when you're already talking about low income Americans. Thank you, Angie. And the next framework that we looked at was the EU's GDPR. As we mentioned, this is considered the gold standard for a lot of data privacy um, legislators or countries. And something that we really honed in on was this piece on demographic information that is collected by companies. So under the GDPR Article 9, only certain entities are allowed to collect, process, and store demographic information that might reveal racial or ethnic origin, political opinion, sexual orientation, anything of that nature. Um, retailers do not fall into this category. These are more medical or governmental entities. However, what we see is that with SNAP OPP, there is very limited to hardly any uh, specifications on types of information collected by retailers. Section 2.4 of the SNAP OPP RFV in their privacy practices section says that personal information must not be compromised, sold, rented, or given away for free to third parties without authorization. However, it does not prohibit, like GDPR does, the actual collection or usage of this data internally, which is concerning given that we've seen past retailers such as Amazon um, come under concern scrutiny by different um, legislators or governments in the US and internationally for actually processing and changing their uh, services based off of this demographic information. So that is a huge concern that we noticed. And the second piece is kind of tied together with opt-in versus opt-out, as well as cookie usage. Uh, the GDPR very explicitly says that 
consent for cookies must be explicit opt in you cannot have a default setting you cannot just say you can opt out if you want it has to be an action taken by the user to opt in as well as information needs to be provided on how the user if they opt in can opt out how they can deactivate this information and how it will be used um, in, contra in contrast the usda's legislation is very loose it says that, quote, they are very concerned about cookie usage. However, they do not have strict guidance um, or any enforceable mechanisms for assessing how companies are actually collecting this data, collecting cookies or anything of the, that nature. As mentioned earlier, they do have an opt in functionality where they say that users or that the USDA specifies there must be an opt in provision for selling the data externally. However, there is no opt-in for having cookies that will collect internal information that will be used to assess demographic information, shopping, purchasing habits by users or sending um, marketing from, for example, Amazon to the user or doing direct marketing or targeted advertisement. So many concerns. Um, however, the EU's GDPR standard and some of the pieces of legislation they have have informed the policy recommendations that we will recommend at the end of this presentation. But I'll now pass it over to Kyle. Great, yes. So uh, then uh, tying this all back towards the anti-competition aspects of this entire conference, um, we really go back towards, the, besides the data, going back to the structural rollout of this uh, pilot program. Given that it was a pilot program, initially they only allowed around eight uh, retailers to actually enter this program. So that really led to like a um, just limitation on how many programs could even uh, use SNAP online purchasing, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when prominently it was mainly Amazon and Walmart that were being referenced. So if you actually called into uh, your social worker, they would often comment, oh, say uh, Amazon has this. And as we had said, only um, in 18 states even today, five or fewer retailers there's um, in those states. So it's just very limited in who even um, is allowed to market. And then amongst the 90 retailers that are even enrolled in this expansion that's happened, um, their majority are large chains and there are not very many small mom and pops or bodega markets. So with that, um, we really go into like the aspects of the existing bottlenecks and the way that this really rolled out. Because of the fact that it was an expanded, uh, very fast expansion, the um, USDA was not uh, necessarily uh, providing enough resources to other grocery stores and such to actually enroll in this program. So that really limited to who even had the financial ability to enroll um, as a grocery store in, in the actual program. So then um, from there as well, then the actual programs that are enrolled, they then uh, have this uh, market power that they can grab onto all of these governmental funds. And then what we're running into now as well is looking at the um, SNAP data disclosures. So as we were saying, the a lot of this uh, extractive data practices that are happening would not even be allowed in the EU, but here they're actually going in and then they extract all this data. And as researchers ourselves, we try to access this, but it's really behind that black box of um, just like what a retailer would say is this is com uh, competitive information, so we can't share this with you. And then they do that as well to try and deny FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Acts. Uh, they hide a lot of this private business information. So there's really very limitations on what we can even um, explore of the actual numbers. We just do know that it's been happening and that then it's just very ironic given that um, health researchers and, and any uh, just researchers that actually want to explore the governmental programs further can't make these actions. Several of our policy recommendations here are, let's just remember the 2014 Farm Bill established originally the SNAP online purchasing pilot and originally included in its language that there would be a reporting requirement. The USDA would have to report to Congress an evaluation report on the implementation of the SNAP online purchasing pilot. And it wasn't specific about what was in the report, but presumably it would have inc included usage, trends, and perhaps a demographic analysis and access analysis, and also potentially some degree of an audit of the different retailers and their privacy and marketing practices. But in the 2018 Farm Bill, 
that reporting requirement was explicitly struck out. For those of you here, I'm sure there are many who like looking through revisions of legal documents and seeing strikeouts. It's a great read. And yeah, we think that um, if that in the next farm bill that the um, reporting requirement should be reinstated, um, a baseline evaluation um, metric. The USDA FNS should establish a SNAP online data security task force. This would mirror the role model of the, the EU's GDPR in that they have independent evaluatory committees looking at the data security practices of different retailers and different entities that use consumer data. Congress should empower the FTC Act to actually litigate retailers violations or at least investigate retailer violations of agency documents like the USDA SNAP online request for volunteers so that say fresh directs violation could actually be investigated. And finally, and perhaps most importantly for laying a long term framework, Congress should mandate that FTC and FNS collaboratively work together to develop independent privacy and marketing guidelines for the entire digital food marketplace, not just for SNAP Online. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. Uh, up next, we have Giancia and Sandro and Kristen, I think, maybe joining us online um, discussing uh, with their empirical assessment of the relationship between the food retail market um, concentration and racial and ethnic inequalities. Hello, um, I'm so happy to present our study that explores the uh, relationship between food retail market concentration and racial ethnic inequities in food swamp exposure. Uh, Sandra, Sandra, feel free to add anything you think I missed. Okay. So first I'll briefly talk about our motivation and the background of the study. Um, previous evidence showed that differences in food access can affect people's dietary intake and weight um, related health outcomes. For an equitable neighborhood level food environment, um, it has been categorized by food deserts, which are the areas with little access to healthy food, and also the food swamps, which are the areas where there are more unhealthy food outlets compared to healthy ones. For racial ethnic minorities or low-income people, they are more likely to live in food deserts or swamps area. And both neighborhood environment conditions have long been identified as a possible driver of the obesity epidemic and also other like diet-related health issues among both adults and children in the US. As for the market structure of US food retail retailing is actually changing rapidly both in rural and urban areas. For this trend, it has significantly impact um, retail competition and also the individual, individuals assess the um, healthy food retailers. Further, um, there are some researchers show that healthy food assess is associated with like racial compositions of a neighborhood for example, there were more like healthy food outlets like supermarket or large grocery stores in predominantly white areas uh, and fewer in black areas. Pre previous research also links um, neighborhood food swamps um, to residential segregation and disparities in individuals' dietary behaviors and uh, health-related outcomes. Um, therefore, um, assessing how changes in food retail market concentration relate to racial and ethnic inequities in food environment is very important to uh, help with um, providing more evidence or guidance for like policy changes. We use the National Establishment Time Series database from 2010 to 2019, which includes 68,300 census checks area. For that database, uh, it has information of food store address, name, and type. We then use the North American Industry Classification System to further guide us to classify different food retail related stores. 
Further, we calculated the count of each category of food outlets I listed here in the equation um, and got the modified retail food environment index, which are the counts of uh, healthy food retail outlets divided by the total counts um, guided by the previous research. <clears throat> Here are the frequency plots for MRFI at sensor track level in 2010 and 2019. Um, all healthy retail food outlets, this category represents their MRFI score equals to 100, when the no healthy food retail outlet represents um, MRFI equals to zero. Uh, we can see, compare those two years, the food swamps areas expanded. Uh, here are the hotspot map of MRFI in 2010 and 2019. Um, this map identifies like the statistically significant hot and cold spots of full swamp exposure. Both hot and cold spots were with three levels of um, confident intervals. For cold spots, um, here are in red, represented statistically significant cluster of low MRFI scores, which is an indication of deserts uh, and full swamps uh, in red, while for hot spots represented the uh, clusters of high MRFI scores, which indicates better healthy food availability uh, in blue. Overall, in both years, healthy food availability tended to be better in northeastern part of New England. Um, and um, those um, food deserts and swamps uh, expanded a little bit in the southern part of New England in 2019 compared to 10 years ago. Mm. And then we, we uh, use the Herfindo index of concentration to calculate um, the market concentration level, uh, which are the self, square sales shares of all food retail related establishments at sensor track level. Uh, we also calculated the group Herfindo index based on the total sales per group to have a sense of um, concentration level based on group level. Uh, here are the hotspot map again of the HHI uh, in both years. Um, and here are the cold spots in red represented the uh, significant um, cluster of HHI, which is like in, indicates the more competitive market, while the hotspot in blue represented uh, those of high HHI uh, indicated more concentrated market. Compared to 2010, market becomes more competitive in the southeastern part of New England. The other variables like race and ethnicity, proportion, population, education, attainment, po poverty rate were from American Community Survey. Uh, we further classify whether the area belongs to metro or non-metro based on the USDA rural urban codes. Uh, here are some line graphs represent the relationship uh, among the MRFI, HHI, uh, and also I uh, include the white and Latinx proportion uh, at sensor track level uh, over the years. We can see the trend of food swamps um, and market concentration changes from uh, this 10 years. Um, the full swamps uh, expanded uh, over the years because MRFI score uh, has a downtrend. Um, the market concentration didn't change much during these years. Um, while for the white proportion at sensor track level uh, has decreased over these years, uh, and uh, but the Latinx proportion gradually increased. We use the two-way fixed effects regression model to further investigate the associations between the food environment and the market concentration. I've listed the baseline model equation here, uh, where we denote the sensor check with I and the year with T. Our outcome is the MRFI score. Um, as our data is left good, we use the exponential regression model, uh, and we also control for like unobserved time invariant factors with sense track fixed 
uh, effect and for common shocks over time with time fixed effects and also the control variables I mentioned earlier um, in the multiplicate arrow. Uh, here the scatter plot for regression models coefficients. In baseline model, we found the market concentration at group level is negatively uh, associated with uh, our MRFS score, which means the higher group concentration level, the higher food swamp exposure uh, stands for worse healthy food assess. Uh, while for market concentration at individual levels is like a a uh, completely different trend um, is possibly associated with MRFS score. Uh, when we add HHI and metro or non-metro interaction to a model, the relationships re still remain the same uh, for both uh, metro and non-metro areas. Uh, in model three, we also added the state time fixed effect. The relationships uh, remains the same as well. Here are just some brief conclusion and some of our um, po policy implications from the study. We found that higher food market concentration based on group level is associated with increased food swamp exposure. Our results also point to the disparities in food swamp exposure by ethnicity, where uh, census tract area with more Latinx population tended to have higher food swamp exposure um, our research might guide food system planning and further identifying racial as minority neighborhoods um, that, burden, that were burdened by inactively built food deserts or swamp areas. For example, more projects such as Healthy Food Financial Initiative uh, that could play a crucial role in ensuring equitable access to healthy food, particularly uh, also for like minority groups. Um, to further improve like healthy food access in these areas to further create and preserve quality jobs to uh, further revitalize um, these communities. More kind of investments need to be made in local and regional food systems as well, um, such as farmers market and local food promotion programs um, to further support local and regional food business enterprises. Uh, and that's for our presentation. Thanks so much. And Connor and Sandro are hungry for antitrust enforcement. Yes, please. All right. So the title of our paper is Hungry for Antitrust Enforcement, Retail Discounters and Food Deserts in America. Um, speaking broadly, our paper covers about three areas. Um, first, the statistical effects of dollar store entry on independent grocer exit. Um, then we talk about the welfare concerns due to this entry of dollar stores and exit of grocers. And then finally, we propose a solution, which is reviving um, the Robinson Patman Act in order to protect healthy competition. Okay, um, our research is, is motivated by, by two interesting national trends. What you see here on the left-hand side is the number of dollar stores in the United States from 1991 to 2019, and on the right-hand side, the number of independent grocery retailers. As you see in that figure, right, the number of dollar stores has expanded significantly, almost five times as large as it had been in the, in the 1990s, while the number of independent grocery retailers had um, fallen significantly. At the same time, if you look at the total employment of dollar stores in metro, rural, and urban areas and compare that to the number of independent the employment in, by independent grocery retailers, we see some very striking trends. The number of dollar store employees has increased significantly over that period, while the number of independent grocery retailers has, has decreased, but that replacement is, is smaller actually than the, than the additional jobs add, added by dollar store entry. So that, that pattern actually motivated our empirical analysis where we want to provide further, further evidence for a cause, 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 causation in that relationship and not just correlation. So what we do here, we, we again use a, a two-way fixed effect regression model, which is a standard kind of econometric model in, in economics to, to try to um, evaluate the relationship in more detail. So what that model does, basically, it, um, it has the 
number of independent grocery retailers, their employment and sales is an outcome variable and relates that to the entry of dollar store in, in the year before. Um, we use here the National Establishment Time Series, which is a retrospective uh, data set on, on um, all employment, all companies in all establishments in the United States. And we use an, an estimator that allows us actually to deal with the large set of zero observations in the data. So to provide you with the baseline results in our, our regression here, what we find actually is that um, dollars to entry into a market leads to a, about 11% drop in the number of independent grocery retailers in a given census tract. If you look into the employment effects, we see that um, if a dollar store enters in the year before into a partic particular census tract, we see that employment of independent grocery retailers drops by about 8.2%. When we look at sales, we find that this effect is a little bit smaller. We find that independent grocery retailers sell about 7% less compared to um, areas where there's no dollar store entry in a given, given pair. Um, these regression results are actually very robust in terms of comparing metro, rural, and urban areas. What you see here are the individual regression results for these three areas. Again, we compare count, employment, and sales. And you see that, that um, the, the effect of dollars to entry is the largest for, for metro areas and the smallest for rural areas in terms of the number of, of businesses that still stay in, in business. Um, while when it comes to employment, we find also the same kind of evidence that rural and urban areas show very similar patterns in terms of employment effects, so about 6% drop in employment in these areas, while the effect in metro areas is, is significantly larger. So there's, there's one more. We also did a simulation to try to, to get an understanding how, how big is that issue actually. Might uh, elasticity tell you one thing, but the question is, what does it actually mean in economic terms? So what you see here is uh, there are two figures. We use the, use the estimation results to do counterfactual evaluation of, of what the market would have looked like without of dollar stores actually expanding as quickly as they had uh, in, in recent years. As you see in the left-hand side, right, there would be about 1,500 independent grocery retailers more in the market. So that's not a, a very large number. Um, when we compare that to the employment, actually, we see that the dollars to entry effects increased until, the, uh, until about 2009, and then they had been almost flat. So we would have um, 24,000 more employees in the independent retail grocery industry in 2019 compared to the counterfactual dollars that wouldn't have expanded. All right, um, so now I'm going to be brief on this uh, for the purposes of time, but that some of the negative welfare effects we see based on dollar store entry and independent grocery exit is a decline in both the quantity and quality of jobs. Um, so food retail employment uh, as a total is lower in these census tracts where dollar stores have entered and the jobs that do remain with dollar stores uh, have poor working conditions. Um, the conditions are poor, so there's a lot of security issues at these dollar stores where issues of gun violence may be prevalent, and a lot of dollar store employees have called for greater security measures, um, but to much failure with dollar stores just ignoring these requests. And there's also an exploitation of federal labor laws. Um, so dollar stores will salary their managers, and what this means is if you work any hours beyond 40 um, as a salaried employee, they don't have to pay you overtime. You're just being paid a baseline salary. So they'll pay them the minimum, which is about 35500 but they'll work these managers who are their top level position 60 to 70 hours a week. So their hourly wage ends up being about $11 an hour, which is um, not very good, especially if that's the highest paid employee at the store. The second thing they do is they hire a lot of part-time employees. Um, the Affordable Care Act mandates that you provide health insurance to employees who work 30 hours or more. Um, dollar stores will frequently employ people for about 20 up to 29 hours a week um, to make sure they can pass that health insurance bill to the federal government. Um, physical well-being of Communities is hurt. This is pretty straightforward. Dollar stores sell little to no fresh produce, um, a lot of processed foods. And then another one is local farmers lose a purchaser in the form of independent grocers, um, where they could have previously sold their produce or meats or whatever goods to that grocer. Um, now they're forced to enter contracts where they usually don't have the economies of scale to be profitable. 
Um, so now onto the solution, uh, reviving the Robinson Patman Act. A little bit of background on it was it was enacted in 1936 at a time when dominant retailers like Sears and A&P uh, were beginning to enter the marketplaces across America, causing the losses of small business. Um, and what it did was it amended Section 2A of the Clayton Act, uh, prohibiting price discrimination by suppliers toward buyers that couldn't be economically justified. So an economic justification for a price discount could be, oh, it's cheaper for us to ship a lot of more products at once, or it's cheaper for our manufacturers to manufacture a bunch at once. Um, so what it was really preventing is just arbitrary price discounts that were meant to gain the favor of uh, large buyers. Um, this act was actually never repealed, but fell out of favor. Um, it fell out of favor because there was concerns that um, this would lead to an inefficient marketplace that would have higher prices for consumers um, and that it protected individual competitors rather than competition as a whole. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that some of the fiercest critics of this act were also some of the strongest supporters of the consumer welfare standard, a standard that's failed since its introduction. Um, so the DOJ hasn't brought a case since 1972 of the Robinson Patman Act, and the FTC has brought just one in the last 30 years. So why revive the RPA? Um, first and foremost, reviving the RPA promotes healthy competition. Um, without enforcement of the RPA, buyer power is often the end all be all of competition between grocers and dollar stores. Um, and like I just mentioned, the economic efficiency concerns are really overstated. Um, if you can justify a discount based on shipping or manufacturing, you're even allowed to justify a discount by saying we, we're meeting like a supplier can. They can say, oh, we're meeting another supplier's price by doing it. So it's already factored in. All these economic inefficiencies that are talked about are already factored in and allowed to be used as a justification. So the bigger concern really is what non-enforcement of the RPA will lead to. And uh, earlier panels kind of hinted at it, but we're getting these geographic markets where dollar stores remain are the only stores that remain. And when stores have monopoly power in a geographic market, there's no need to compete with prices. There's no need to innovate. And ultimately that's gonna lead to higher consumer prices. Um, second, there's no modification needed to achieve enforcement of the RPA. It's still good law. Um, and Congress intended to create a strong enforcement statute and um, they did. Uh, the Supreme Court issued very enforcement friendly precedent in Morton Salt. Um, there they said that a violation of the Robson Patman Act only required that proving that price discrimination may lead to destroying competition, a very low burden to prove. Um, the third reason to revive it is that we shouldn't have concerns about judicial backlog uh, relating to the RPA. Um, Private plaintiffs have high evidentiary burdens to um, bring a private RPA claim because first they need to prove the violation of the RPA, which I mentioned is fairly easy due to Morton Salt, but they also have to be able to prove damages and a Supreme Court case made this second part fairly difficult by making private plaintiffs show the damage, the actual damages they incurred, um, rather than the easier standard where a plaintiff would only have to show the amount of the price discrimination. So what this means is rather than saying suppliers sold um, 100 units to for $200 to the dollar store and 100 units to me for $300, my damages are $100. Now you have to be able to show, okay, they sold that to me for 300 and to the competitor for 200 and I lost X amount of customers who went to the dollar store because I had to charge a little bit more. So it's very hard to prove a private case. And then fourth, um, this one might be easy to overlook, but uh, it provides a deterrence that's completely missing from today's uh, arena. Right now, suppliers engaging in price discrimination have no concerns about facing punishment under the RPA. Um, with no public enforcement, or I suppose there's been one in the last 30 years, um, and private lawsuits being so tough to achieve, um, there's really no deterrent quality of facing a lawsuit. So as it stands, if you're a supplier and you're doing uh, the cost benefit analysis, I mean, if you're a profit seeking company, why would you not break the Robinson Patent Act? 
Um, so hopefully public enforcement would shift this cost benefit analysis of suppliers um, back towards one of legality. So <clears throat> the final question is, how does this enforcement begin? Um, and ironically, the enforcement should begin with an inquiry by the FTC. And this is ironic because this is how the Robinson Patman Act first began was an inquiry by Congress and then the FTC on the extent of price discrimination. So here we are about 100 years later and we need to do the same thing. We need to explore the extent that suppliers engage in secondary line discrimination. And the inquiry should also look into things like packaging and product supply discrimination. Um, and that is things like a dollar store maybe having access to those what they call cheater size bags of potato chips um, where only the dollar stores have it and it's a dollar and it's like oh this is a bag of chips but really those packages have much fewer ounces per uh, bag than your one you'd get at a grocery store um, and ultimately the findings from this inquiry should guide the enforcement efforts.